Right. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for coming on the morning after the banquet. I appreciate this very much, even going through rain. Um, in case you're wondering what this is apart from me playing risky, this is Apple Keynote on an iPad going through an Apple TV. So just in, in case anyone is interested. Yeah, so we are here in, well, and now it, no? that's very good. Good, as I say, this is playing risky. Um, shouldn't I have moved it? Sorry. Sorry. No, that is on, that is on. Okay. I have, oh, yeah, okay. So, um, and this is, there is actually something, I think this is just the um, colors on the, on the projector, yeah. So, since we are in a cinema here, I thought I'll start with a cinema opening. <laughs> And we zoom in to where the action happens. It uh, happens at the letter G. And as Misha told us, G is a group. For some people, of course, G also is a graph. And in fact, these worlds aren't really that separate. If you are interested in group theory, as I am, you have graphs occurring naturally as domains for group actions, as areas where groups arise, as automorphism groups, as graphs. We have seen Cayley graphs. And there is a whole area of group theory called geometric group theory, which basically deals with the geometry of Cayley graphs. Um, vice versa, if you come from graph theory, you have often that interesting graphs have non-trivial symmetry groups and sometimes my personal criterion for a graph being interesting is it has a non-trivial symmetry group um, and groups can be used to describe graphs in compact form. Um, yeah, as I said, I come from computational group theory and basically what I want to do in this talk is to tell you a little bit about computational group theory in particular software and what I'll try to do is to persuade you that this is something useful to have, uh, which will help you also in calculations in algebraic combinatorics. So group theory, computational group theory, has several reasonably sophisticated software packages. The two main ones are Magma and Gap. Gap is the one I will for for reason of not knowing better or shamelessly advertising, I will use here. They have a convenient programming language, convenient for mathematicians in the sense of that you never need to worry about stuff like memory management or so. Um, it has data types for lists, sets which behave as you would do. You can add further things to a set without having to, to declare types or so. You have arithmetic over standard domains, rational numbers with arbitrary precision, finite fields, algebraic extensions of both of these, linear algebra, polynomials over all of these fields. Coming from group theory, we have some group data types, permutations, words, user-defined objects. Um, and we also have a couple of packages, and I want to mention in particular grape and design, both written or co-written by Leonard. Um, which are specifically dealing with graphs and, and designs. So, to start, yeah, what, 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 what do I want to do here? I'm not planning to give you a description of the algorithms of computational group theory. I don't think that would be appropriate both by audience and by time uh, to, to do something very technical. What I will do is to describe some calculations that can be done, which I think will, give you, will be useful as examples for the kinds of calculations you are doing, or at least what I have seen in some of talks coming up as, as structures. Um, and I will try to point out some functions which I think ought to 
deserve to be known better than they currently are. Some of these calculations are potentially quite expensive. Well, that's, that's in some way fine. If the computer spends time, that's better than if I spend time. So I'm not so much worried about, well, the calculation should finish in, my, in, in, in a time which I'm willing to, to wait for it. But there are some cases where there are hard calculations, and I think we shouldn't shy away from doing hard calculations if they have a chance, chance to finish. OK, so as a toy example, I've picked the example I very naively thought about when I saw the Peterson graph. I thought, oh, I can generalize this. Why just take five? Let's take more than five. Let's do the same construction, but on two twice seven vertices. And if we do this, of course, we now have two options. We can go um, in steps of two on the inner circle, or we can go in steps of three. While for the Peterson graph, we, this will give us the same graph because two plus three is five. Um, in case you're interested with, uh, um, with these graph pictures, they actually are graphs which I had in Grape, and then I have a small file which is on the web pages uh, I listed on the first, first slide, um, Hulpke slash Villanova, um, which will export graphs in Grape in the GraphWiz format. This is file.dot, and then I used OmniGraphle which is a Mac graphics program which can import this to, to align the vertices nicely and display it pretty. OK. Um, anyhow, that's just a side remark. So yeah, we can make these constructions with two or three steps of two or three in the inner circle. And I just want to show you very naively a construction how one can put these graphs into grape. So we load the grape package which, as I mentioned, was written by Len Seutcher. Uh, and here, yes, and I know Len will crucify me for this. I'm starting without any automorphism group. That's not really what Grape is, wants the user to do. You should really start with, an, with automorphisms to, to save your work in constructing the graph. So I'm really doing it as naively as could be. I, start, I make a graph where I'm starting the null graph, no edges, no group, 14 vertices. OK. Oh, sorry, that wasn't yet what I wanted to do. No, I'm. OK. Um, yeah, and now I'm going through and I'm adding edges. The command in grape is called edge, ed, edge orbit because it assumes there is an automorphism group acting which will calculate images. And you will automatically add the whole orbit. In this case, the orbit is in some way trivial. And what I'm, going, what I'm doing here is I'm adding the outer circle. I'm adding connection. Um, no, sorry. I'm adding connections between every vertex and the vertex plus seven. This is outer to inner. I'm making the outer circle. I'm making the inner circle. And I'm doing things twice because by default, a graph in grape is directed. And this will make the edges in both ways. And then I ask Grape for what the automorphism group is. This will actually call Naughty. There is Grape contains an interface to Naughty for calculating that automorphism group. By now, this interface also should work on a Windows machine, which for a long time it didn't. Um, yes, and if you look at this automorphism group, well, that's the point where I then was very disappointed. Well, you all know this probably. The automorphism group is not transitive. What happens is if you flip the outer and the inner circle, the step two inner circle becomes a step three inner circle. And that's <coughs> really why there is just one Peterson graph and not a Peterson family. OK. Yeah. Uh, so, if you work with groups, the basic setup in computational group theory is that we assume we have an arithmetic for the group elements available. Say an arithmetic for permutations and arithmetic for matrices. And what we then want to do is we don't want to store the whole group. We want to store just a very, very small part of elements. 
our input is a generating set for the group and a generating set typically is of size logarithmic in the group order because by Lagrange's theorem every time you add a new element in your subgroup gets larger it needs to get lar larger at least by a factor two so the number of generators in the very worst case in the worst case is vector spaces is the logarithm uh, in the group order and then there are two basic operations and that's really what computation group theory initially has to do it it is to build data structures which let us do something more interesting with these groups and data structures which don't rely on writing down all elements but only rely on writing down relatively few extra elements and what these data structures allow us to do is to calculate group order if it is finite or at least subgroup index this already would allow us to test membership because if we have an element we can could add it to the group calculate the order again and see did the order change if yes the element wasn't in there but we want a little bit more from membership we want what is called constructive membership we want to write an element as a word in the generators which basically will let us evaluate homomorphisms if we give a homomorphism on generators and building these data structures is what the computer needs to do initially this can take time if you define the group the first calculation might take a little while because it is building this data structure also the way how you build this data structure will be very different depending on what kind of group you have so the way how a group is represented oh why did this go already the way how a group is represented um, can have an enormous impact on uh, how quickly how well the computer can work with this group and there are various ways how one can describe such groups there is well on the bottom here generic means basically I have a group where I don't have anything else but arithmetic of elements I have matrix groups groups of permutations finitely presented groups are groups given by generators and relations and there is a special case of these groups which are called polycyclic groups which basically have a very particular presentation which makes it nice to fi find the normal form of words but algorithms will perform very differently with very different efficiency depending how groups are, are represented in particular if you end up in a situation where you fall back in the generic case and most frequently this is probably happening if you form a product and that product or for this product formally because Skep doesn't know better forms it in a generic in generic product elements you fall into the generic routines which enumerate elements um, in this case you often get okay and this is probably unreadable the error an error message exceeded the permitted memory since that error message caused again and again problems with people not understanding what it means this is not yet saying the system has exhausted all the memory there this is saying be careful I'm using a lot of memory you can continue with return you could type return and the system will continue the calculation just if you do this on a multi-user system or even if this is just your desktop and you want to do something else if you run if you allocate more and more memory at some point you get the biggest system into its knees okay so we have these different areas and they are in some way dependent on each other so generic groups often actually calculate a faithful permutation representation similarly matrix groups matrix groups sometimes use methods for polycyclic groups for for sol solvable subgroups polycyclic groups inherently because they are presentations use some of the mechanism for finitely presented group that was the original or, or let's say the interdependence as it was 15 20 years ago but in the last years really it turns out that algorithms more and more 
really used the other structures. And since this is a graph theory conference, I thought <laughs> I'd put at least one other graph on there. It now turns out that also permutation group methods use matrix groups and use finitely presented groups and finitely presented groups use permutation groups and there is a model of something which are called black box groups. It's a formalism of groups which don't have anything but element arithmetic and element comparison but this formalism actually turns out to be very useful for describing some calculations without being distracted by, by structural information which one doesn't need. Anyhow, in practice, it means that it is useful sometimes to change your representation. And what you can do is you can often, if you construct a group, tell gap in which representation you want it. For example, cyclic group by default is a policy is a PC group. If you want it instead as a permutation group, you need to tell the system explicitly. And there are also functions isomorphism, perm group, isomorphism, PC group, and so on, which give you an isomorphism from a group you have to another representation, which hopefully will be more amenable to your calculations. Sometimes this works well. Sometimes it can degrade the representation and doesn't really help you that much. But yeah, in some cases in particular, if you're in the generic situation, this is worth doing. And then what do algorithms do? There are basically three paradigms they use. They try to classify things, not everything, but they classify up to conjugacy. And that is the orbit algorithm. And I'll talk about this in a little moment. The orbit algorithm has a big problem. And the big problem is that the number of generators for a stabilizer, which it also calculates, grows with the index of the stabilizer. So in general, number of generators grows with the subgroup index. Most of them are redundant, but no one has found a generic good method which could a priori tell which generators are redundant. And instead of doing redundancy tests, what has turned out to be very useful is to say, let's not worry about this, but let's use random methods. Let's just pick a random set or a set of random products of generators. So we have fewer. And chances are quite high, and one can prove this actually rather rigidly with probabilities that relatively small number of generators is enough and will has very high probability of generating the group. Um, of course, there is a chance that something goes wrong. So one needs to verify the results. And verification essentially happens by calculating a composition series, calculating a presentation based on the composition series, and verifying that presentation. That's not something you need to worry about at the, at, as the user. But that is something what the system does internally. Well, and then the two, well, in some way obvious reductions are, how can we reduce to something smaller if we have a group? We can reduce to a subgroup, or we can reduce to a factor group. Well, in fact, we want the factor group to be connected to the group, so we want a homomorphism, the natural homomorphism for this factor group. And the methods for this go under the name of solvable radical method or trivial fitting method where we look in particular at homomorphisms whose kernel is a vector space. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, I mentioned already the generator number goes up. That is sometimes difficult. OK, so the one algorithm I want to show you and not really go into detail is the orbit stabilizer algorithm. So what does this? This algorithm takes a point little omega, and it calculates the orbit of this point little omega under the group. How does it do, this, do so if we have group generators? Well, the orbit is the set of all images. So we would need to map this point under all images. Well, we don't have all group elements. We just have generators. But every element is a product of group generators. So we map this point under all generators, and possibly their inverses if the group is infinite. And then we take all these images and map them again under all generators. 
and so on, and so on, and so on, till it becomes stable. And since every element is a product of generators, we will have calculated images under all products. If once it gets stable, we have found the whole orbit. And that's basically what the or orbit algorithm does. On the way, we can do two extra things. We can um, calculate a transversal or a set of transporter elements. This is this set T. And basically, how do we calculate this? We just keep track how we got a new element. F when we get a new image, here in this case, this is this image gamma, as image of an old element under a generator, we record that the element which got us little delta times this generator will give us little gamma. So one can get this basically for free. Um, furthermore, what you will get later once the algorithm gets towards termination, you will get the same image again. Of course, if you have two different elements which both map omega to little delta, little g and little h do, then little g divided by h maps omega to omega. Well, so it maps omega to omega, so it lies in the stabilizer. And there is a theorem, this is Schreier's theorem, which says these elements generate the stabilizer. So that's what I'm doing here. But you will get these often. It's an easy combinatorial count to see that you basically get orbit length times number of gen generator minus one um, as number of such Schreier generators. This is a huge number. That's this problem I mentioned on the previous slide about the total number of generators becoming very large. Yeah, in this orbit algorithm, in some way, the cost is not there where you initially assume it. Well, the first thing to observe is that we might have to store a lot of group elements here. Well, one can get around this using something which is called a Schreier vector, basically not calculating out this product, but storing this in product form with pointers. That is relatively easy. But then the cost lies in this test. We get an image and we want to see, does this image already lie in the orbit? So we have a huge number of elements and we get a new one. We want to see, is this one of them? Well, this is a stand, in some way a standard computer science problem. This is a problem of searching. And what GAP does is that it has a data type which is called a dictionary. And this data type is intended to encapsulate the different things which one can do to do such tests. In some situations, hashing is very good, but you need a hash function. In some cases, you can at least use a sorted list because you have comparison. But in some situations, you have nothing. You just have equality tests. And this dictionary data type tries to hide this and enca encapsulate this. The corollary, of course, is if you're acting on objects which the system doesn't yet know or for which the system doesn't yet have a good hash function or comparison built in, then an orbit algorithm can take very long and it might be worth to look at this and actually add corresponding functionality to build, get good performance in the orbit algorithm. Um, and here we have generators. I just say I add these new generators there. In practice, I want to remove redundant generators, for example, by doing membership tests or by um, removing or by keeping these generators and initially all and then forming random products and just keeping some of them. Um, in, yeah, so this is the basic orbit stabilizer algorithm. In a few cases, for permutation groups, there are backtrack algorithms which also do orbit type calculations, in particular stabilizer or transporter elements. For example, element conjugacy, element centralizer, subgroup normalizer, set stabilizer. They work more elaborate, more a bit like what Naughty does for graph isomorphism. Uh, but generically, one often falls in such an orbit algorithm. And I've tried several times to write a gener very generic orbit algorithm, but in the end, actually, I found myself 
I don't know how often I rewrote the orbit algorithm because in practice, every case somehow has special situations where you, can, where you can use extra information to make it faster. And that's really why I'm mentioning this algorithm explicitly. This is not hard to implement. But if you think about how it does this, if you have an orbit type calculation and it is slow, think about this algorithm and you quite likely in your situation might be able to see, oh, this is the bit where I really should improve or where I could improve and the system isn't just clever enough to do this automatically. Right, yeah, there are of course standard orbit functions built in and if your orbits don't get too large, they perform reasonably well. You can implement the action by a function you write yourself if you want to act on your own objects. You can write a function which does, does this you can have the action not by the generators, but by homomorphic images of the generators. For example, if your permutation group acts linearly on a vector space, you can, by keeping track how the generators map images, you get automatically a homomorphism, and you can evaluate this homomorphism. Um, if your orbits are large, that means if the stabilizers have large index, it can be useful. Again, the cost is proportional roughly to the index. If you know a block system that would give you an intermediate subgroup, this is very much worth doing uh, to try to find a smaller orbit length, which is an intermediate subgroup which lies between the point stabilizer and the whole group. Okay, so here I have a small example of an orbit calculation, I take the Mathieu group M12, I take the symmetric group S12, and I'm taking all six element sets from points 1 to 12. That's what's happening in this second line. And what I'm now doing here is I calculate on these sets where there are about almost 1,000 of them, I calculate the orbits of the Mathieu group on these sets and I'm giving an explicit function for the action here, the function on sets. And I find there are two orbits, one of length 792, one of length 132. I'm calling actually not orbits but orbits domain. Orbits domain guarantees that the set, that I'll never leave this set of points and then some things can get a little bit more efficient. Well, so I have a collection of sets here. So M12, since it's maximal in A12, should be the stabilizer of this set of 132 sets. There is an action on sets of sets. If I try to calculate that stabilizer, GEP initially complains that the action is not well defined. That's because a set for GEP needs to be sorted. And it turns out in this case it isn't yet. So I don't take just what I got here. I for make explicitly again a set out of it which sorts it. I calculate the stabilizer in this action on sets of sets and indeed what I end up with is M12. For a more graph theoretic example, let me briefly construct what is called the tat coxeter graph. So I start with what Sylvester called duads and synthemes. UATs are subsets from 1 to 6 of order 2. Synthemes are now combinations, are partitions of the points 1 to 6 into triples of duads, and that's what I'm doing here. So I take, the way I'm forming these is that I first take pairs of duads which don't intersect and then finally add the remaining two points uh, as a last set. And what I can do is in grape is actually to form a graph and have as vertices some set of objects. So here my vertices I want to form or take are the duads and the synthemes. And I think I have even somewhere a list of the synthemes. So these are partitions into uh, three cells of two each. Okay, 
Well, and what I'm now doing is I want to describe when is a duet neighbor, neighboring a synth theme. When are they connected? Well, the definition in this graph says they are neighboring if and only if the duet is contained in the synth theme. So the set of order two is a subset of that partition, and that's what I'm doing in this function here. So I'm giving a function which just tells is one contained in the other or the other contained in the first. In this case, one of them must be a duet, the other one a synth theme, and they might be contained. I form this graph. I can ask for how many edges does it have, what's the diameter, girth. I can ask for the automorphism group. It's a distance regular graph, very nice. And as a group theorist, of course, I'm interested in what is this automorphism group. Uh, oh yeah, and here is a not particularly nicely symmetrized picture of the graph in case anyone is interested. Um, so this group is on um, is of order twice 720 or four times the order of A6. Um, I could, for example, ask how would it embed into the wreath product S6 wreath C2. So here I'm forming this wreath product and there is one function, that's one of these functions which is very useful but potentially takes very long. Isomorphic subgroups. This finds homomorphisms from this smaller group. This, the convention in GAP is opt arguments of a function are always sorted from large to smaller. That's why they are in this order. Uh, from this group O into monomorphisms into the group W into the wreath product up to conjugacy and it finds, up to conjugacy of the images and this finds this one homomorphism here. Of course, I could have done this differently. I could have gone back to my group, to my automorphism group here, and looked at systems of imprimitivity. So this group acts on the unions of synth themes and duets. So we have overall 30 of them. It's a group of degree 30. Um, so what I could do alternatively to embed into the wreath product is to use the krasner kaluzhnin theorem. So I'm calculating blocks and it will find um, blocks of order two. I can take, no sorry, it finds two blocks of order 15 in this case because I'm, I'm in S6 wreath C2. It finds blocks of order 15. I take the action of the group on these blocks. Okay, I'm giving this argument, well, I'll, I'll explain that argument subjective in a moment. I also take the block stabilizer and I take, because I want the action of S6 six on six points, take its maximal subgroups. I find there is a maximal subgroup, say the third class, which has index six. I take the action on these cosets and then there is a function which for, for typing convenience is not called krasna kaluzhnin also because kaluzhnin has different transliterations depending whether you use German or French transliteration, which does the standard embedding into a wreath product theorem um, and would give me the corresponding generators and then I could form this homomorphism. Okay. Next, I want to look at homomorphisms. There are basically three ways which one can use to construct homomorphisms. The first one is I give group generators and their images. So that is done using the function group homomorphism by images or group homomorphism by images NC. The NC stands for no check. By default, GAP often does checks on the arguments that you actually give plausible input. Often these checks can be expensive, for example, testing that something is a homomorphism. So this NC will say, trust me, it is correct, don't do the check, be fast. Next, we can take the action on a set of objects. 
This will give us permutation images, and this is what we call an action homomorphism. By default, an action homomorphism goes into the full symmetric group. Well, if you act on 20,000 objects, you don't want to construct S20,000 just to have somewhere where your images are. You actually just want to take the image group and make this homomorphism surjective, and you can do so by giving the string surjective as a last argument. So this is something which is, for larger domains, useful for performance. And then there are some functions which find homomorphisms. Find all homomorphisms with a given kernel. Well, that's finding a homomorphism which gives me a factor group. So this is natural homomorphism by normal subgroup. There is a function which for finds all homomorphisms with a given image, modulo equivalent, e equivalence being having the same kernel. That is called G quotients. And I mentioned already isomorphic subgroups that finds all, all monomorphisms which have images of a particular isomorphism type. These two searches, they can take a while, but again, in some cases, this is actually better than, than doing, having to do it by hand, and I think they're, they're pretty powerful functions to, to have. Okay, the third paradigm I had was subgroups, and there I just want to very briefly talk about there is a function, conjugacy classes, subgroups, which finds all. Well, if your group gets larger, you don't want all. Um, it uses already by now in the newest version a database of simple groups to try to, to get their subgroups quickly. Uh, but if your group gets larger, you really can't store all subgroups. What are obvious restrictions? Can you go into a pseudo subgroup or a whole subgroup? Can you restrict to maximal subgroups? And the function to use there is maximal subgroup class reps because you don't want them all, but you just want representatives. This is a function which is relatively newly improved in GAP in that it works efficiently not just for solvable groups, but also for other groups, for permutation groups. And I'll have a larger example later. Um, can we find orbit stabilizers or block stabilizers, subgroups in homomorphic images? And if we have homomorphic images, often what is happening, we are first working in the factor group, find the image of the subgroup there. We can find, if we can also find how the subgroup we want intersects with a normal subgroup, then the situation is essentially that we need to find, we know this subgroup, this subgroup, and we need to find a complement. Such complements one can find using cohomology or sometimes in the case of stabilizers, actually just by taking the generators here, correcting them by elements of M N to stabilize, and then we get this subgroup there. Okay, one standard combinatorial construction is a construction in parts. We have two parts and we want to combine, combine them in a certain way. So we have one part omega, we have one part delta, they both have automorphisms, we connect them in one point. And we want to classify these up to automorphisms, up to symmetries of the product. And it turns out, in this case, basically, we take the automorphisms of both objects, take in there the stabilizer of this joint object, and then the classes of such objects, well, excluding the fact that we could swap both parts, correspond to double cosets. That's why double cosets are, are important. And I want to give you one example of this because I think this is a generic construction which is useful for combinatorics. The example I want to give you is the example of intransitive groups. Again, also because sometimes you want to have small intransitive groups because you know that you have a particular action on one kind of objects and a particular other action on another kind of objects. So the situation there in group theory is what is called a subdirect product. We have a group U which has two projections. Imagine the projections actions on two orbits, one image A, one image B. What we can do is we can calculate the kernels of these projections and project them under the other projection. So the kernel of the projection on the second orbit 
projects to the first orbit and will, because it's a normal subgroup, the image will be a normal subgroup. And what we get from this structure is that these factor groups all have to be isomorphic. So what we need to have is we need to have, if we do this, want to do this synthetically, we need to have two groups A and B with isomorphic factor groups, and we need to classify, combine these isomorphic factor groups and describe the possible isomorphisms. To do this systematically, we choose A and B in the symmetric group up to conjugacy, find normal subgroups D and E, D in A, E in B, up to conjugacy by the normalizer of A, we want to keep the, and the normalizer of B, we want to keep the projections the same. We want that the factor groups are isomorphic, and then we want to find representatives of in the automorphism group. To find all isomorphisms, we take the automorphism group of the factor and in there calculate these double cosets. And this is not swapping A and B. That would, would need something extra. Okay. Don't be scared of the next slides. This is not something I, you, you should now try to read through. This is something I thought I give you, and I'll give you this file on the web pages. This is a function which does this construction. And I just very briefly want to point out what, what I'm doing is really just this construction in steps. I take two symmetric groups, I calculate the normalizers in there, I take the normal subgroups, but I take them up to conjugacy with this normalizer. So I will need to have the action of one subgroup on a set of other subgroups. Well, I could take orbits, but if you take orbits on subgroups, it has the problem that some orbits can be very long. So there is a particular function, subgroup orbits and normalizers, which tries to do conjugacy tests if these tend to be faster and better than other tests. We do the same with subgroups here. We have two normal subgroups. We test, are the factor groups isomorphic? If yes, we calculate the automorphism group. Because calculations are more efficient in permutation groups, I calculate the isomorphic permutation image. And now I calculate the double cosets. And basically, this slide is one command because I need to calculate these induced automorphisms. And what you see here, and this is something which is typical when working with concretely with groups, is there are homomorphisms all over. Why? Because the computer isn't clever enough to realize that you can tell it, oh, if I write this, I really mean this. By abuse of notation, let me write this. You can't do this. You need to tell the computer explicitly. And so a lot of such constructions, you can't just write a bar over it. You need to do the homomorphisms explicitly. And that's why there are so many homomorphisms in there. But it's basically the initial group. And then I'm forming two subgroups here in the same way. And I'm calculating the double cosets. And finally, I combine the generators. And I, as a toy thing, if I do these possible subdirect products of S3 and S4, I get three of them, S3 glued to completely together with S4. So the, the isomorphism type is S4, but permutation isomorphism type is different. I can glue them together in a common factor group of order two, and I can glue them together in a common factor group of order one. This is also called the direct product. And I have these three groups. Uh, but I now could do it, for example, for all groups on four points and on three points, and thereby find intransitive subgroups of degree seven with an orbit of length three and length four. And I can verify just in case, I, since I was wondering, is my code correct? Yes, I got the same. I got really all the subgroups there. Um, I also, and again, this is another code basically just to give you as a reference, if you want to construct your own objects in GAP, what do you need to do? You need to, and in some way this first thing you can almost copy verbatim. You need to have a category that describes what can these objects do. I want to be able to multiply them. You need to have a family which is a hook 
for all of these objects to, to have something together and you need a representation which in this case is basically based on lists. And now the objects I'm simulating here is the multiplicative group of the rational of the complex numbers with rational coordinates just as an easy example. You need to implement only a function to create your objects, a function to print your objects because you actually want to see what is happening. You need to implement one function for, for getting the one element, so the zeroth power, a multiplication and an inverse. And the rest will happen automatically. Division is using multiplication and inverse, powering is using both, and you need to implement a function for equality and for comparison. And once you have this, you can form groups of these elements. So here I'm form taking these objects, I'm forming the cyclic group formed by one element. Gap is whining here because I didn't put in some extra syntactic sugar to assure that um, this group is, that these elements multiply associatively and I could now, for example, calculate an isomorphism to a PC group for this group of order four to work more efficiently with it. So this is a very quick way to take weird group elements and bring them into a form which is nicer to work with. Um, let me close with something about matrix groups. So at the moment, matrix groups still always in gap by default always translate to permutation groups by acting on vectors. This is not a good strategy because you can get orbits which are very long and you ca can in particular have unavoidable orbits which are very long. For example, if you take the full GL. Um, what has been developed over the last 15, 20 years almost is something which goes under the name of matrix group recognition, which says let's first calculate the structure. And what is done there is we split the group apart. We try to find homomorphisms by acting on suitable things. So let's take the group, we find a homomorphism by acting on something. We have a smaller image, we have a smaller kernel, and we chop this apart more and more till we end up with simple factors. And there is a package in GAP which is called RECOG, which provides a concrete implementation of this. This RECOG package was written by, by Akko Scherisch and Max Neunhofer. Um, and now, and but this is still experimental code, I have code which basically interfaces this to the standard way how we work with groups. By acting on the non-abelian composition factors, we find what is called the solvable radical, the largest normal solvable subgroup. Then the factor group of this has a very nice and very easy structure. It's basically automorphisms groups of simple groups, wreath symmetric groups, and we can represent this nicely as a permutation group. This kernel is solvable, so we can represent it by a polycyclic presentation. So in some way we can decompose the matrix group into a permutation group and a polycyclic group. And they are both nicer to work with. And many algorithms use this. And let me finish with this example here. This is code. If you want to play with it, this will also be on these web pages. This is very much experimental code. It might run into errors. You will need the newest version of GAP. It will print all kinds of debug information. This is the function recog radical, and it will need tons of packages to load. You really need to have all of them, otherwise it doesn't work. But let me show you this example. I'm taking the third maximal subgroup of the Thompson group. These are 248 by 248 matrices. You don't want to calculate action on vectors over, yes, it's over GF2, I think, but you still don't want to, to calculate orbits on vectors. I'm calculating this function fitting free lift setup, set which eventually should be hidden automatically, should, will calculate all these data structure things. And now I have a homomorphism onto a permutation group. I think this is just a nine or something. No, it can't be. It's, it's I think, just an alternating group. I have a polycyclic generating set for this solvable radical. 
Okay, and now this is a concrete calculation. This is a concrete calculation which takes, I think, under a minute on my computer and just does things with matrices. I can calculate conjugacy classes. And this is just the standard conjugacy class algorithm just using the new data structure. Or I can calculate representatives of the maximal subgroups just using the matrix groups, using the new data structure, and I get these maximal subgroups here. And I never need to go to the permutation world. I hope that there is a lot which needs to still be fixed to make this work, nice, work nicely. For example, here, I'm not using index because index by default does a membership test and I don't yet have something in which does this. So by, uh, please, if you're interested in it, play with it, but be aware there are a lot of nice things still missing, but it really lets you work with groups of a completely different quality than one was able before. Right, and I think this is a good point where I should stop. Thank you. Question? Yes. Yeah? Let me discuss the program for calculating of automatism group of graphs. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that there are two very good programs. Both are based on Orbit federalized theorem. Mm -hmm. The first is Naughty by mm -hmm. Adam McKay, and second is program written by Igor Harad, mm -hmm. which is implemented Mm -hmm. According to the name Nauti, program of Brendan is working perfectly. It's finitely. Uh, uh, the, graph, uh, the, the group is smooth. Yes. Group of, uh, program of Igor is mm -hmm. working perfectly. Mm -hmm. The group is primitive. Mm -hmm. Experience shows thousands of vertices mm -hmm. can be done in mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. However, both programs are pending when we have highly imprimitive graphs. And it has a few hundreds of vertices. Mm -hmm. Pending means we never know when oh yeah. we will reach. Mm? And the reason is was mentioned by yeah. you because huge amount of generators. Yeah. However, there is a very good alternative for human. Human will make X-ray of this graph and will understand that this graph can be described very perfectly using theory of something like generalized, generalized race product. There mm? are a few papers by Cameron and mm? other pe mm? uh, people. And after that, as soon as we understand the structure, we can calculate group in a few minutes. Yes. Question, is it possible to teach computers to do this human job? Y yeah, well, yes. Uh, as an existence statement, I would say yes, this is possible. Um, let me see whether I can quickly go back to this slide. Basically, I think what you want to do is you want to go to this picture. You want to take, you, well, you need to somehow recognize your imprimitivity structure. So let's assume you have this imprimitivity structure. But they are in visible in graph theoretical terms. So yes. In group terms. Okay. Yes. But so you first describe the, ec but if you have this imprimitivity structure, you first take your action on the blocks. So this would give you something like, uh, no, that wasn't the one I wanted. This will give you something like a factor group. <laughs> and you take the action on one. And I think what you need to do is you take the wreath product and then you calculate some such complement by doing, doing a correction of generators. I would think that one, well, at least theoretically one can combine them. I would, I would think naively, but... Um, it sometimes is that also that really, it's the same when you calculate subgroups. There are good functions to find the maximal subgroups. There are good functions to find the minimal subgroups. They are the cyclic ones. To find a subgroup which is a roughly root of the group order in size, that's the hardest bit. And it might op still be that, that this is there. But I would really think, don't start by not taking the full symmetric group, take the wreath product and stabilize the parts first and then try to see can you get to such a situation that your stabilizer must be a complement. And essentially then your work is just to see can you find this right, right complement. <laughs> that's, that's what I would, would try. Uh, 